Today's Father's Day, you know, I thought, should I do a Father's Day message? Then I thought, no, I better not do that because then the women will sit here twiddling their thumbs and you know, they might be elbowing their husbands and, and that sort of thing. I thought it would be safer for us to look at the love of the Father, the love that God the Father has for us. And I know that when I say the word Father in conjunction with God, that for some of you, that really drums up some bad feelings because you had an earthly father that wasn't so loving. Maybe you had an lo- earthly father that was very demanding. Maybe you had an earthly father that was really non-existent or whatever the case may be. Maybe he was an abusive father. When you hear the word father, and even as we sang that song, you're a good, good father, you had a really hard time singing that song because of your earthly father. And I wanna just say today, if you would do me a favor and set aside your earthly father, whether he was the best father on the planet or the worst father on the planet, set the earthly fathers aside and let's focus today only on the love that God the Father has for us. I have a couple of quotes. First, love can only be known from the actions it prompts. Love can only be known from the actions it prompts and God's love is seen in the gift of his son. Another says, one day a single friend asked a father of four, why do you love your kids? The father thought for a minute, the only answer he could come up with was, because they're mine. The children had no need to do anything to prove themselves to this father. He just took them as they were. So it is with God's love for us. He loves us as we are, and it is his love that motivates us to trust and obey him in return. God's the initiator, and we're the responder. We're told that God is our father, and we'll see that we are the children, and as God is the father, he is the initiator of the love that he sent his son to display at the cross. C.S. Lewis said on the whole, God's love is a much safer subject to think about than our love for him. And I think there couldn't be a better way to spend Father's Day than to think about the love that God the Father has for us, which is our first point, the love of the Father. And if you're in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, look with me at the first verse. It says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Now, if we were to look at the NIV, it says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. God has lavished his love on us. It says in the NIV, I think in a a way for us to understand it a little bit better, but what this really could be translated as, behold what peculiar, out of this world kind of love the Father has bestowed on us. That's because the word what manner means behold of what country. So if you lived in the first century in a Greek seaport town, You might one day be about your business and suddenly there would be a rustle among the people down on the docks and word would spread through the town that a ship was coming. People would move down towards the docks and look on the horizon at the approaching ship. By the sail configuration, they could tell whether the ship was from their own country or a foreign country. You would hear people ask in Greek, kotopein, which means of what country? What new people are coming to visit? What new things are we going to learn? The word translated what kind of here in John, this is a very unusual word that only occurs six times in the New Testament and it bristles with surprise, astonishment, urgency, and excitement. What kind of love the Father has given to us? This is the word astonished the disciples used when Jesus calmed the sea. They said, what manner of man is this? Where is he from that even the wind and the sea obey him? Think about it. The love that God has towards us is not like human love at all. As a matter of fact, we can't even begin to scratch the surface of the depths of the love of God. Paul writes this in Ephesians when he's talking about the height and the length and the depth and the width. To know the love of Christ, he says, which surpasses knowledge. Which means we, in our human minds, cannot fathom how much God loves us. There are some, they spend their whole ministry life 
only talking about the love of God and nothing else. And so you have people that know their love with a lack of knowledge. You have others that focus on teaching the deep knowledge of God without the love of God. You've gotta have a balance. You've gotta know the love of God towards you, but you've also got to understand the doctrine behind it as best you can. It says, what manner of love? Well, 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. You wanna understand love? Then you need to begin as best you can to understand who God is. It's out of this world. It's peculiar. Human love is limited by conditions. And I said earlier, don't compare your earthly father to the love of God the Father. Because our earthly fathers, if they're not there, or they're there and we never seem to please them, we'll spend our lives trying to. The father wound is a very real thing. Prisons are filled with men and women who didn't have fathers, or did have fathers, but they were tyrants. I found out this week that Father's Day is the number 16th celebrated holiday in America, number 16. Now, it was a comedian that was talking about it, and he said, I can't think of 15 other holidays. <laughs> number one is Christmas, number two is Mother's Day, number 16 is Father's Day. Think about that. If Satan can get the father out of the house, if Satan can get the country to eradicate fathers by saying things like toxic masculinity is bad, do you know that's just being a normal man? It's just being a normal man. I brought up on Wednesday night that men, they love to build machines that peel out and throw dirt and all this stuff. And the men were like, well, most men are like, yeah, yeah, that's awesome, right? And then the women are like, I don't get it. <laughs> because you're a woman, you're not that way. And then, and then I had a couple people, and just to, I, I didn't think to put it up, but it's two little boys, it's a video. They sent me this video, it's two little boys. One is on, he's got training wheels on his bike. He's got it in a puddle. The rear wheel is in the puddle. The training wheels are holding the tire just off the ground, and he's pedaling as fast as he can. And his little brother is sitting behind him with goggles on. <laughs> While the water is flying in his face, he's just sitting there with the water going in his face. And they said, this made me think of your message on Wednesday night. And I just laughed. And I said, that is exactly what we men are. It's just that you get older and it gets more sophisticated and your toys get bigger and uh, more expensive. And right, that's what happens. But we need, that's not toxic masculinity. Amen. Letting boys jump off the couch and oh my goodness. That's what moms do. The moms say, oh no, don't let him jump off the counter. The dad's like, he's fine. You could jump higher than that though. <laughs> so God gave us husbands and wives. If it was just husbands, then the kids might not make it. <laughs> right? So moms help balance dads out. But when it comes to love, we don't understand this love. This love is out of this world. It's peculiar. And we can shy away from it. We can hide from it. We can say, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't want to try to understand it. And we sterilize God and we keep God in a box. But didn't Jesus say that we would know the truth and the truth would set us free? And I hope and pray that this message sets you free from whatever father wound you may have. If you, at, at your age, and look, after first service, I had people of all ages coming up to share that the message had ministered to them because they didn't quite think of the love of God in that way. Some were repulsed throughout their lives by the idea that God loves them just because. We want to feel like we earn God's love. You can't. Could you have ever, if you have an earthly father that's a tyrant and you tried to earn his love, could you ever earn his love? The answer is no, because nothing that you'll ever do will be good enough. But just so you know, God's love isn't earned or kept. Just think about that for a moment. God's love is entirely different. You cannot earn it, you cannot keep it, and you cannot lose it. God just loves you. Isn't that wild? Look, sometimes I look in the mirror and I don't like what I see. God's like, I love you. 
And you're like, why? I have asked, God, why do you love me like this? Why? Why? Makes no sense, but he does. God's love was displayed to us at the cross. Look at John 15, verse 13. John 15, 13. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. There's no greater way to show love. Look, don't you say things when you're young and you're dating and you want the girl to know you love her so much, man. You say, I love you so much, I would die for you. Right? I told my wife now, I love you so much, I'll share my food with you. (laughs) Early when we were dating, we went out. I got something, she got something. It was different. And she began to reach across the table with her fork, which was immediately met with my fork. I was like, what are you doing? She said, I was going to try, and I said, no. I'm more like, I'll scrape it onto your plate, and that's fine, but don't put your fork on my plate. <laughs> okay, I hadn't really thought, you know, well, if I give her a kiss and she eats food off my plate, it's really no different, but in my mind, it was completely different. <laughs> completely different. But I have been reformed, I have since repented, and now we can share food. Isn't that great? See, there's hope for me, there's hope for you. <laughs> Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love was displayed at the cross. The world doesn't like that. The world doesn't like the cross. It's offensive. You're darn right is it offensive. You know why? Because it says you're a sinner and you need a savior. And if you're offended by that, then you don't like it. But when you recognize your need for God, then you love the cross because you love the man that died on the cross, because you love the man that rose from the dead, that ensured you're, you're gonna be able to go to heaven when you die because of what he did. So is God's love towards us based on our merits or our goodness or our righteousness? The answer is no. The answer is absolutely not. Look at Luke chapter 18, verse 19. Luke 18, verse 19. Jesus is called good teacher And so he says to this young man, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. So often I will ask people, hey, how you doing? And they say, good. And I'll say, no, you're not, because only one is good, and that is God. (laughs) If Jesus says only one is good, and that's God, he's God. So he's saying he's the only one good, which means nobody else is good. So you ask people, Hey, do you believe there's a God? Yeah, I believe there's a God. Do you believe there's a heaven? Yeah, I believe there's a heaven. Do you believe there's a hell? Yeah, I believe there's a hell. Do you believe you'll be in heaven one day? Yeah. Oh, why? Because I'm good. You're good enough to get to heaven? Oh, yeah. I keep the Ten Commandments. Oh. You never broken any of them? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just hoping that in the end, my good outweighs my bad, and there's going to be scales, right? And God will put... Here's the thing, though. The people that do that, they don't really actually keep track of how much good or bad they're doing. And they have no idea that they're mostly doing bad and that the scale is like slammed to the floor on the bad side. It's like pinned to the floor. There's no amount of good you could ever do that would tip that scale until Christ came along and he puts his little finger on that scale and just, right? Right? Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Go down a little further. There is none who seeks after God. There is none who does good, no, not one. So nobody does good. By the way, anybody that's an unbeliever or not yet a a child of God, they're not seeking God. You may be open to the idea of God, but you're not truly seeking. I wasn't. I watched God transform my, my earthly father's life. And then he invited me to the Harvest Crusade, and I went to the Harvest Crusade very reluctantly, by the way, and it was some words that I heard there that I was either undecided for or against God, and that changed for me because I thought I was mostly good, and I was sitting on God's side of the field, and God showed me, Shadrach, you're, you're not only not on my side, you're on the other side, you are not for me. And I realized then, okay, I gotta make a choice. 
and I join God's team. Do you think you can earn God's love by keeping the Ten Commandments? Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Let's make sure that we understand the purpose of the law. Romans 3, 19 says, Now we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay, so who are those right now that are under the law? Those that are not yet children of God. If you are not a child of God right now, you are under the law. Meaning, if you die today, you'll be judged by the law according to what you've done. No good will be at that judgment someday. You will be judged entirely on all the bad things that you've done. Think about that for a moment. Therefore, verse 20, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We look at the law and we go, oh, I broke that. Now, I've heard people that, that they think they don't break the law because they say, well, I didn't actually do it. Then Jesus came along in the Sermon on the Mount. He was like, oh, by the way, have you ever looked at a woman and, and lusted for her? Oh, uh, yeah. Then you broke the law. He went from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. Think about it. How many of you have kids? Raise your hand. Do you have kids? How many of your kids drive you nuts? Raise your hand. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some hands went back up. <laughs> Do you want good things for your kids simply because you just want them to be obedient to you? Or do you want your kids to do what's right because you want them to have a good life? The latter, correct? Don't you want your children to have better and to do better than you have in your life? Every parent that I know is doing their best to raise their children to have a better life than they had. Nobody's like, oh, I hope my child grows up and becomes a crackhead. <laughs> oh, I'd be so blessed if he's a meth addict. You don't want your kids to get caught up in those things. So you do everything possible to steer them from that life. Just remember, they're watching you, mom and dad. What you say will be overshadowed by what you do. Don't just say, do as I say, not as I do, because they will do as you do and not as you say. Don't ask me to repeat that. <laughs> They're watching you. If you spend every, well, you're here, so you're not, you're not there, but if you spend every Sunday on the soccer field and you tell your kids God's number one and the, and the biggest priority of your life, what do you think that they will grow up believing? that God is the number one priority of the life or that he's number two. I think that the latter, now you say, well, we watch online. Okay, I get that. And you say, well, we don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I've heard, I've heard all these arguments, but the Bible does say in Romans 10, not to forsake the gathering together of the saints. Paul said that we're the body of Christ. We're members individually of one another. One's an eye, one's a hand, one's a foot. Could you imagine on a number of Sunday mornings, the foot's gone and part of the church is hopping around like, hey, feels like something's wrong. What's going on? Oh, the foot's not here today. Well, where are they? Well, they be, or where have they been for the last month? Oh, they've been off on some grand adventure. Where's the church if there's no eye? Can we cut the finger off and leave it aside and it's, and it's going to effectively be a part of the family of God? The answer is No. So is going to church in person important? The answer is yes. For those of you watching online, I understand that you may live in a place where you don't have that. Okay, I'm not talking to you, but I'm talking to the folks that do have it. Don't take for granted what you have. We hear from all over the country and all over the world, I wish there was a Bible teaching church in my area. I wish that there was a church like this in my area. Don't take what you have for granted. So the, the law was given to show us our need for a savior. Look at Galatians chapter three, verse 24. This says the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ. So the law is doing this. Come on, you need Jesus. Come on, come on. Uh oh, yeah, see what you did right there? Okay, that's why you need Jesus. Huh? That's what the law is doing. That we might be justified by what? Faith. We are not justified by the law. We are justified by faith. Is faith doing anything? The answer is no. Think of justified just like this. Just if I'd never sinned. 
just if I'd never sinned. That's how God looks at you. As a child of God, he looks at you as if you have never sinned. Well, question, have you sinned? Oh, yes. Yes. Are you a sinner saved by grace? Oh, yeah. Dirty, rotten sinner saved by grace. But when God looks at you, that's not what he sees. He sees Jesus. God's love for us in Christ is amazing. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 38. Romans 8, verse 38. Listen to what Paul writes. And by the way, Romans 8 is, is an amazing chapter. Amazing chapter. We're just gonna look at two verses because Paul says here, it's sort of like the crescendo of this chapter. He says, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus by our Lord. Sometimes you might say, I just don't feel like God loves me. God didn't ask you to feel like he loves you. He asked you to know that he loves you. And you need to know that because whether you feel it or not, it is a biblical truth. He loves you. And there's nothing you can do that's gonna change that. People try to come up with like hypothetical scenarios. Well, if I run over my dog and I do this, well, then will he not love me? It's like, well, are you planning on running over your dog? No. Then stop thinking about it. Just rest in God's love. Can you do that? Just rest in God's love right, right now. Just take a deep breath. And just breathe out. Just relax. God loves you. But the world, forget the world right now. God loves you. You're in this place. 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. We wouldn't know what love was if it wasn't for Jesus dying on the cross. Now let's look at point number two, his love for his children. Back in verse one, he continues, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we'll be like him for we will see him as he is and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So we're to keep this in our minds and think about it so that we purify ourselves. I am someday going to be like Jesus, but right now, I am a child of God. His love is displayed in two ways. One, in what we are. We are children of God. Isn't that wild? You are a child of God. Now, you have children that live in your house. If you have kids, right, then they do live in your house, maybe, or they live outside your house. They grew up in your home for some period of time. Some, by nature, just always want to please you, and then another one comes along, he's like, yeah, what the first one did, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> You're like, go left, and he's like, I'm going to go right. You say, go right, he'll go left. It doesn't matter. Whatever you say, he'll go the opposite direction, right? They can get testy. They can get difficult. Do you love them any less? I love you because you're so good all the time, and you, I don't love so much because you're not so good all the time. No, you love them. We are children of God. This is a term that describes origin, birth, family relationship, family likeness, and family characteristics. We are children of God. John 1 verse 12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were not born, who were born, sorry, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If God didn't do anything, we would have never said, I want a relationship with God. We were born again by the will of God. He is the one that initiated this, not us. Man did not make this up. Man did not make this up. There's no way man could have made up this Bible. Nope, sorry. Nope. As children of God, we are heirs with Christ through adoption. Now, if you have children that came out of your, your loins... You didn't get to pick them. You didn't pick their hair color. You didn't pick their eye color. You're just stuck with what comes out. <laughs> I, I remember telling my mom one time, well, I didn't ask to be born. And I think she said something like, well, I didn't ask for you to be born. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, touche. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell the high school students, you know, you might say something like that to your parents, but just know they didn't pick you either. <laughs> they just got stuck with what came out. 
But when you adopt, you choose. Think about this. You choose. So however you're going to adopt a child, most people that I know are like, we'll just take a child. Just, if, if there's a child to be adopted, we'll take the child. But if you go and they say, let's say that the child is older. This child is seven and they like to light things on fire and they <laughs> break every mirror in the house, you know, and you're like, oh, I don't think I'll take that child to my house. <laughs> Thank you. But if a, if a person comes along and says, I will take that child and I will love that child no matter what. Think about that. Because that's what God did. He looked at you and he said, oh, they like to sin a lot. <laughs> but I'll take them. Chose us. It's amazing. Yeah. Romans eight fifteen, Again, in Romans 8, right? You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I was meeting with a lady one time. Some, one of the folks from our church said, would you come out? My mom is home on hospice. I don't know how long she has. Uh, she actually lived quite a while, but I would go out and visit. She had a very nice house in a kind of a nicer neighborhood, right? And I said, hey, when you pass away someday, because we we're talking about God being our father and you don't call anybody on earth your father. She'd grown up in the Catholic church and she just really had a hard time with really what message I was giving her through the gospel. And I said, let me ask you a question. When you die, are you leaving me anything? And she says, oh no, I don't think I will. Without hesitation. And I was like, you didn't have to say it so fast. I mean, you could have just been a little nicer and been like, well, maybe I'll leave you, you know, I don't know, an ashtray or something, you know. I was going to throw it away anyways, but not that I need an ashtray, okay, just to make, make clear. Yeah. Someone's like, well, what does he need an ashtray for, huh? <laughs> I don't. It's just like the most obnoxious thing I could think of in the moment. So I said, of course, I would be surprised if you left me something because I'm not your kid. But what about your, your children? She says they're getting everything. Grandchildren, oh, they're all, they're all going to split it up. They're all getting some. So that's exactly the heart and the love that God has towards us. But the only way you can experience that is through Christ. And then she was like, oh, oh. She prayed to receive Christ. She said, do I have to start going to your church though? I said, no. <laughs> She thought I was there to sell our church. I was like, hey, selling our church? I'm here to freely give you Jesus. Amen. That's it. You know, it's so hard for people to understand. Why? Because religion has done a lot of damage in the world, right? And unfortunately, parents have done a lot of damage in children's lives. It doesn't matter how old you are, you still carry those wounds with you. Cry out, Abba, Father. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. When did he choose us? Before the world was even made. Isn't that rad? Before the world was even made. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Look at verse five. Having predestined us to adoption as sons predestined us to adoption? Predestined means to choose in advance. Foreknowledge means to know in advance. Foreknowledge and predestination are like bookends. You gotta have both or else the rest of the doctrine falls apart. You end up with some crazy stuff if you don't keep them together. Predestination and foreknowledge. He did choose us in advance. He did. But it was according to foreknowledge. What was it that he knew? We could all argue about it. We could say, well, it's this or that or the other. Some would say, we don't know, whatever. But, well, let me just ask you a question. Would you want someone in heaven that wouldn't want to be there? Let's say that you were picking teams. You were picking teams, and you had a basketball team. Like when I was a kid and played basketball at school, you wouldn't pick the kid on your team that you knew didn't want to be on your team and would do everything that they could to make you lose. You wouldn't pick that, that kid. You have that foreknowledge, right? Well, that kid doesn't want to be on my team. And even though they're a good player, 
I'm not gonna put them on my team because they'll shoot baskets for the other side. Is that what it is? I don't know exactly, but I do know this. He predestined us to adoption, and adoption's not the same. If God just had kids, which he doesn't, right? He just had kids. It was like, well, you're just what came out. I'm stuck with you. I love you because I have to because you're my kid. It's not the way he looks at us. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to. Verse six, to the praise of his glory by which he made us accepted in the beloved. We've been adopted into the family of God. We're part of the family. That's amazing. And once we're born into the family, he never aborts us. He doesn't abort his kids. Think about those that think, well, I, I became born again, but then I did this bad thing, and then I'm unborn again. Let's follow this logic just for one moment. What kind of sin would you have to do to be unborn again? Now, a lot of people like to focus on what I call the dirty dozen, right? You, you were drinking, you were cheating on your spouse, like whatever, like the dirty dozen, right? But did you know that any sin would be enough to get you, if that was the case, booted out of the family, right? So even some small thing, you're driving down the freeway, someone cuts you off and you cuss at them. You're out, right? You're out. Could you imagine you're driving down the road, you're like, praise Jesus, I love you. Oh, it's such a good message this morning. Someone gets in front of you, slams on their brakes, and you, and you bleepity bleep. <laughs> and God's like, out. <laughs> oh, then how do you get back in? Well, then we say, well, we repent, of course. Oh, so he's like, you're out. And right after that, you repent. He's like, Back in. <laughs> Think about it. You're out, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in. Is that what you do with your kids? If we're gonna reflect the Father's nature, then that's what we must do with our kids. When they sin, we must throw them out of the house, change their last name. <laughs> you say you're going too far. I would like you to show me through the scripture that I'm going too far. Because if we're going to imitate God the Father, then we must do what those people teach. Do you understand? You mean God just loves me? Even if I blow it? Oh. Did you think that you got saved by the cross of Christ and then kept your salvation by your goodness? That's a joke. We just read there's none good, no, not one. Is that too much for you? Then you need to pray and you need to search the scriptures for yourself and stop listening to men. Because that's the problem. You say, well, Shadrach, you're a man. I, I'm not saying listen to me. Don't listen to me. I don't care if you believe a word I say. I hope you don't. And I hope you go read your Bible for yourself. Take your commentary, set them aside, get in your Bible, and find out for yourself because that's what I've done. <laughs> listen to what Ephesians 1.13 says. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? He purchased you, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you lost your salvation, then the seal would have to be broken. You understand? The real question is, are you a child of God or not? That's the real question. We tend to believe that everybody that says they're a Christian is a Christian. That is not the case, my friend. John also says in 1 John that there are some that they go out from us because they were not among us. They went out proving that they were not part of the fold. So those that would say, oh, I was a Christian, I grew up as a Christian, I was a Christian, and now I'm an atheist. You were never a Christian. You were never born again. You were never part of the family of God. Now turn to Luke chapter 15 because I think that this beautifully encapsulates what I'm trying to communicate to you in the story of the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15 though, we're gonna skip down to verse 17 and skip the whole first part for the sake of time. This young man that was the prodigal son had gone and wasted his life on prodigal living. He had gone to his dad and said, dad, you're dead to me, give me my inheritance. And after he is, his dad had given him his inheritance, 
It says he went off to a far country and he wasted it all on prodigal living. And verse 17, it says, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to who? His father. And I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice his estimation. I'm no longer worthy to be called the son of my father because of what I did. Now, look at what Jesus says happens. He arose and came to his father. Circle the word, but, underline it, highlight it, tattoo it on your forehead. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So if the father saw him a long way off, what was the father doing? Waiting watching with anger with a belt with a rod no waiting with love in anticipation that his son would come home and when he saw him a long way off he didn't say oh man is he gonna get it give me a switch off the tree i'm gonna tan his hide (laughs) he didn't say you get over here right now no The father ran, fell on him, and kissed him on the neck. Who told this story? Jesus. Thomas said, show us the father. And Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the father. Did Jesus ever do that to anybody? The woman caught in the very act of adultery? She was going to be stoned to death? Did Jesus say, where's my stone? No. No got down on the ground and he began to write in the sand. And of course, everybody speculates as to what he's writing in the sand. Could he have written the names of those standing around and their sin? Could be. We don't know. All we know is that they, from the oldest to the youngest, being convicted, dropped their rocks and walked away. And when Jesus said to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? She said, there isn't any. And what did he say? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, when you are born again, you are no longer living a life of sin. That's the difference. You are saved. You are set free. You're born again. You're free to not sin, not to go sin and go do whatever you want. So the father ran, fell on his son's neck, and he kissed him. And the son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandal on his feet. Verse 24, for this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Isn't that amazing? The Bible says that angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. There's a party in heaven every time over one person. Number two, we will be like him. Romans 8, again, verse 21, says creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know the whole uh, creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. And not only that, we also have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. Oh, how I groan in these days. Oh, I can't wait to go to heaven. I can't wait. Can you? If you're like, oh no, I hope heaven waits. Where, what world do you live in? What planet are you living on? 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then I shall know as I am known. I look forward to that day. So right now I know I'm a child of God. That's my identity. I am a child of God. And I can live in in the freedom of that. And then two, what I will be. Now let's look at our point number three, and that's his children's love for one another. So if God loved us, then that has to be lived out. It has to be lived out. We have got to love one another. And by one another, I mean anybody that's a believer, whether they go to this church or not. This is not our church against another church, you know, kind of thing. I get like us standing and calling out churches that are not teaching the scriptures, they're abusing sheep, they're manipulating sheep, they're lying to sheep. I'm not talking about so-called churches. I'm talking about other brothers, truly brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe they have some differences of doctrines, 
you know, some of the minor, not major doctrines, but some of the minor doctrines, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to love one another. We see each other out in public and find out that the other person's a believer. We should be high-fiving, not, what church do you go to? Oh, I don't like that church. <laughs> Fighting people. Look at verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. That's the standard. Now look at what he says. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In kind, Jesus laid down his life for us. We lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? James actually says something almost completely identical. He says, if you have a church and someone comes in dressed in nice clothes and you say, oh, 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 come sit here. And then another man comes in, he looks kind of frumpy, and you go, you in the back. Get over there in the back. Have you not shown partiality and committed sin? So we've got to be careful. But this also, that if we see someone in need and we shut up our heart from them, when we have the ability to help, when God puts a need in your path, and you say, come with me to Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, you know, we, we might, and not in every case, but we might fill the need. And you know who misses out? You do. You know who will get the reward in heaven? We will. Don't you want it? God puts a need in your path and you have the ability to do something about it? Help. Amen. Don't look for someone else. You were there. God put you in that situation. Help out. Let us not love, he says in verse 18, in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth, in our actions and with our words. Verse 19, by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Some people walk around all their lives beating themselves up. You know, I don't know, am I a Christian? Am I born again? So the first thing I'll say is, let me see your Bible. Let me see your Bible. Okay, here, you hold your Bible up like this, all right? Now throw it in the trash. You know what people do? I could never, how dare you? I could never do that. Why? Do you think that the world has a problem throwing this in the trash? No, not a problem at all. They say, what, this, that's God's word? Oh, AI is gonna come out and rewrite it. We'll all be better off. It's gonna write all the wrongs of religion. Yeah, of religion it might, but not of the word of God, because this is not a religion, man. Right? So think about it. Oh, yeah, I could, I could throw that. But not a believer. You're a child of God. You go, oh, no, that's my Bible. Right? Well, then stop letting Satan beat you up and tell you just because you had this thought, you're not saved. That whole torment. Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us a commandment. 1 John 4, 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Amen. He loved us. Now, do children always get along? <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> do you let them go at it in your house? No. If your kids are fighting, you, you, you wait. You're hoping they'll work it out, and then you may have to step in, right? You don't go in and say, all right, you in that corner, you in this corner. Okay, here, steak knife for each of you. <laughs> when I say go... You want them to work it out. And you may have to step in and work it out. But we need to lay our lives down. And we do that by imitating him. Have you ever seen little kids imitate their parents? Remember I said just a little while ago, you can tell them the right to do, but they'll end up doing what you do. Hmm? So when they learn to drive, you're like, okay, Junior, make sure you obey the speed limit, but you're doing 90 everywhere you go. <laughs> like it's pole position. Juniors watched you growing up, so as soon as they get in the car, they're like, hey. there's a guy up the street, he's got a Corvette, and his kids have fast cars. It's like, it's like father like son, right? There's America's Funniest Videos, some years back, little boy, he was about four, he has a little plastic golf cub, and they said, okay, show us how daddy golfs, and he goes like this, boom, and he hits the floor, and he throws the golf club, and he goes, stupid golf club. <laughs> you know what we learned by that? Dad blames the golf clubs for his lack of golf game. <laughs> he did exactly what he had seen. 
And we're to do exactly what we see God the Father do. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us. Imitate him by loving others. It has to be that we are other-centered, not self-centered. Self-centered says things like, I want it my way, I want it in my time, and I want it the way I want it. It's like Burger King. I want life my way. And then you order a hamburger without pickles, and it comes out with pickles on it, and you throw it at them. Have you seen those people just going off on people in, in fast food establishments because they got their order wrong? <gasps> I can't handle it. I've got to chuck my food at you and scream at everybody in the store. Are you kidding me? Why don't you just be patient and just say, oh, I'm sorry, this wasn't made correctly. Can I get another one? Here's what I found, right? You go to in and out and you say, oh, I'm sorry, I asked this for this without pickles. And they're like, oh, no problem. They'll make you another one, you get two free hamburgers. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you do that to get a free hamburger. <laughs> but what good does it do to go over and feel like, all right, that's it, I'm tearing everybody apart and in and out right now because there's pickles on my hamburger, and I said, no pick. Have you ever made a mistake? What would you do if someone swooped in every time you made a mistake and had to scream and yell at you and make a big deal out of it in front of everybody? Years ago, I had heard from some that worked in lo local restaurants around that they actually dreaded Sunday afternoon at times because the Christians would come in and they would be the ones to scream and yell and get all testy about their food being messed up. We're to be the most gracious, loving, forgiving people on the planet. I was somewhere recently and asked for some, oh yeah, bought a wetsuit for the baptism and we went to a place in Newport Beach and the kid says, oh, let me see the price tag. And I said, okay. And he goes, what does it say? And I go, well, you can give it to me for less if you want. I mean, I was just, and he goes, okay. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's great. He doesn't know, you know, it's not like, oh, it's Shadrach. He doesn't know who I am. He doesn't care. He's like, you're some old, old guy. So he says, yeah, he goes, yeah, you guys are being so cool. And I was like, wow. Could you imagine if you're just nice to people? They just give you stuff. <laughs> I mean, give you discounts. Another time, a number of years back, I went into another surf shop to get some booties to go down and baptize, and I said to the girl, I said, hey, do you guys have a we feel sorry for you because you live in the Inland Empire discount? <laughs> and she says, well, tomorrow we're having a sale, and I said, yeah, but I live in the Inland Empire, so I won't be back down here tomorrow. I said, I'm just, I'm just messing with you. And she goes, I'll give you an, my employee discount. And I was like, wait, what? She says, yeah, I'll give you my employee discount. She punches in, and I was like, are you kidding me right now? Hang on, let me go buy some more stuff. It's <laughs> 40% off. I said, oh my gosh, you are so sweet. What's your name? And I told her, God bless you. That was just like so kind. And she made my day. That made her day. And you know, if, if I could do that in a, such a simple way, could we do that with each other at church? Like with our seats and stuff. You know, we only talk about it because for some of you, it is a really big deal. <laughs> and it really shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. I challenge you. You guys are free. Right after service, just go ahead and go under your seat and see if your name is on there. Because <laughs> it's not. And if you put it, we'll burn the chair. <laughs> okay, we need to move on. <laughs> Love must be lived out. Now, when we say love, we need to define love, right? Because the world just uses the word love. We say, I love my wife, I love my car, I love my dog, and we do not mean the same thing because if you love your car as much as you love your wife, then you are gonna live in that car. <laughs> so the Greek, they had a few words. Phileo was one. This is brotherly love. This is actually found in John 21 when Jesus goes to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? The word that Peter uses is, is agape. It's the highest form of love. And Peter responds with, you know I phileo you. I, I love you like a brother. Why, I think Peter realized that his mouth got him into a lot of trouble and he realized when he said things like, 
Though all will betray you, I never will. And then he's the one to betray Jesus three times. And here Jesus restores that relationship with him. He uses that word. Storge is a natural affection or a natural obligation or a family love. Eros is what, let's make this clear. Eros, which is a love of passion, it's an emotional involvement based on body chemistry. This is what June, those people that are saying love is love, they really need to say eros is eros because they do not mean love in the way that God means love. And I wanna say this, if that's you, if you've posted that and you believe that, you're being ripped off because God's love surpasses any human love. And that's just a physical love. It's like the lowest form of love when you can experience the highest form of love, which is God's love that will set you free. And agape is that love. It's not kindled by merit or worth of its object, but it originates in God's own God-given nature because God is love. Think about that. So God has set forth the example according to his word. He has loved us sacrificially, then we're to love others. Jesus in John 13 verse 34 said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. How did Jesus love us? He died on the cross, died to self, so that we could live. And we're to do the same for others around us. We're to die so that they can live. We're to put ourselves last and we're to put others first. Verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Don't we want the community to know that about us? That we love one another? Yes. We see each other in the community, it should be like, Oh my gosh, hey, I've seen you at church. You stole my parking spot, (laughs) but I forgive you. I wrote my name with chalk last week. That's the, I'm just joking about that, but but we should be out in the community loving on, on one another. You know what's wild? I pulled up to a fast food window one day and I was getting ready to pay and the woman that was getting ready to hand the food, she says, your food's been paid for. And I was like, by who? I'm in the drive-thru. And I look in, and there's someone from the church, and they're going. (laughs) I I didn't know who it was. It was just, hey. So I'm walking around, someone will say, Shadrach. I've never seen him before, and I'm like, hey. Because I might not know you, please don't be offended. I might not have seen you or met you yet, right? But the reality is when we're out, we do that stuff towards each other. And, and some of you go out of your way and you do that for unbelievers. You walk up and you're just like, hey, the guy behind me, pay for his coffee. Hey, the guy behind me, see that family over there? We're gonna pay for their dinner. Because you know what happens? They go, why would you do that? Because isn't the world like, oh, no, no, we earn love. And you're showing them the love of God? I did it for no reason at all. Just simply that you would know the love of Christ. You don't have to stand and preach to the whole place, but you can do something like that. You can help somebody. One of your neighbors, you can go to your neighbor's house and just help them. Help them do something. Maybe you see that there's a single mom that lives on your block. Go mow her yard. Do something to help. Let them see the love of Christ through you. Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren have been called to liberty, only do not use your liberty as opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you're consumed by one another. We don't wanna be consumed by one another. You know, I really didn't like the way that pastor did that. I used to be in that ministry, but I don't like that pastor anymore, so I'm gonna make sure everybody around this church knows it. Bite and devour, watch out. Where's that spirit coming from? Not the Lord. Ephesians 4, verse one, walk worthy of the calling. The word worthy in the Greek is axiom. It means of equal weight or value. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering. Look at bearing with one another in love. Don't we have to bear with one another sometimes? Yeah, there's a lot of people. We're bound to rub somebody wrong. We're about to get on someone's nerves. It's funny, I brought up pen clicking last service and someone's smacking their gum during the service. Some of you are oblivious, you're like. (laughs) 
And I'm like, mm. I'm going to break that pen. Or they're chewing their gum. Just not, not thinking, like completely clueless, right? And then some of us that are like a little OCD about that kind of thing, we're just like, please stop. We need a bear. You don't get up and go, hey, knock it off. I want to jam that gum down your throat. I'm going to break your pen and chuck it across the sanctuary. But isn't it easy? Come on, there's a lot of people in here, right? Isn't that easy to be like that? But we need to be patient. Pray. Okay, Lord, you're teaching me something in this moment. <laughs> as hard as it is, there's something in me that still needs to be worked out of me. Look at Hebrews 10.24. Hebrews 10.24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. So this is your homework for this week. You're gonna think about ways of motivating people around you to love and good works. You're gonna come up with ways to bless one another in the church, right? You're maybe gonna save a seat for somebody that you don't know. Hmm? You're gonna get her early, you're gonna save an extra seat, and then you're gonna go around and, and try to find someone that doesn't have a seat and you're gonna say, come sit with us. Someone maybe for the very first time is gonna come into church and say, man, I went to that church and someone saved a seat for me and they were a complete stranger. But you think, you pray between you and Jesus and you figure out what it is and then begin to do it. We need to love on one another. You guys, the world hates our guts. The world does not want us around. They're openly saying, we're gonna chop off their heads. Yes. We've already got enough opposition out there. We don't need it in here, we're on the same team. We need, we need each other. And so much more as we see the world going crazy around us. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity before you leave this place today to learn how to become a child of God. Many of you already are. But I will not take it for granted that in a setting this size, there's not at least a couple people who have not yet become children of God. You might have even come in here today with some ill intention in your heart. You said, I'm gonna go into that church and I'm gonna make a ruckus. And God, by his Holy Spirit, sat you down and zipped your lips and has kept you restrained from saying or doing what you came in here to do. And I want you to hear this from the heart of God. Jesus said in John chapter three to a religious man that in order for him to go to heaven, he must be born again. He said in verse five, unless one is born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In John three sixteen, just 25 words, communicates the father's heart, his plan, and his will. His heart that he loved the world, his plan, was that he gave his only begotten son, and three, his will that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You can become born again, number one, by admitting you are a sinner, by repenting. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Number two, you must repent from your sins, Acts 2.38. You must believe that Jesus is God, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. John 3.18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned, and he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then last, you must confess your, with your mouth what you believe. In Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that awesome? Do we want your sign up for something? No. We want you to give us your money? No. Do you have to start attending this church? No. But God wants you to be a part of his family. He wants you to experience the love of the Father that maybe you have never experienced in your life before. With that, will you guys close your eyes and bow your heads? Today, God has made known to you, even in some small way, his love for you. He has displayed that love at the cross of Christ 
And today, if you would like to become a child of God, if you wanna become born again, if you wanna have life and that more abundantly, if you wanna experience the peace and the forgiveness that God has for you, then today you can do so by raising your hand and acknowledging and in a moment making that confession with your mouth and believing in your heart. So if that's you, I just want you to raise up your hand. Just raise up your hand and say, Shadrach, today I'd like to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I see hands going up all over the room. Don't be ashamed. Put them up. Put them up nice and high and hold them up so that I can see. It's not raising your hand that saves you. It's what Jesus did on the cross and it's your believing it. So simple today. On Father's Day, of all days, would be the best day to receive Jesus. Anyone else in this last moment I see hands up all over the back. Okay, go ahead and put them down. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, and those of us that are already believers are gonna pray along with you to encourage you. Pray this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. Please forgive me for all my sins. I believe, Jesus, that you are God, that you died on the cross, and you rose from the dead. I receive you now, as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you every single day. And Father, as we close in a song of worship, would you be glorified high and lifted up. Wash your children, cleanse your children, use your children, Lord, to your glory. As we exit this place, may we do so with the attitude in the heart that would truly reflect you as we seek to imitate you this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.